Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. This episode is also being shared on the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio's feed. And this is something I'm going to do as a go forward. I'll share one episode of uh, any ongoing series we're doing on uh, the amazing world of radio, including our summer series, so listeners who are interested can choose to go over to amazing.greatdetectives.net to subscribe. We are doing a series, uh, J- uh, the Jack Webb Centennial series currently, uh, this is the third episode. The first two episodes covered uh, Webb's career in San Francisco on radio station KGO with the Jack Webb uh, show for comedy and the news and commentary series one out of seven. In the later portion of 1946, Webb's radio efforts in San Francisco had some success as he starred in Pat Novak for Hire, written by Richard Breen. The series originated in San Francisco and was broadcast over ABC West Coast affiliates. Buoyed by the success, Webb headed to Hollywood, as did Breen, in early 1947. Two and a half years later, Webb would begin Dragnet. But in those intervening years, Webb had to make it as an actor in Hollywood. He only had a few movie roles, though some of them were quite important, such as He Walks by Night, where a conversation with the police advisor to the program set the stage for Dragnet uh, down the road. Still, during these years, Webb's uh, work ultimately was down to radio. He starred in three separate detective programs that were on the air for a total of about 15 months. In addition to that, Webb's hard-boiled performances had given him an in with William Russo, who gave Webb regular work as the uh, police foil to Michael Shane on The New Adventures of Michael Shane, and also for a time on uh, Murder and Mr. Malone. Yet the key to being able to make a living in radio during the golden age of radio was to do radio work and a lot of it. Even if you had your own series, that didn't write your ticket. Jack Webb's uh, key to financial stability in this uh, period was making a lot of radio appearances. And the vast majority of his radio appearances was as various tough guys. He'd play cops and he'd play thugs. If you listen to Webb's radiography and the list of programs, you know, you'll find several episodes of suspense. And on most of those episodes... He's playing either a policeman or a thug, and he's not even playing a prominent role. I've gone through uh, the, all these Jack Webb programs, and you listen to all episodes of Suspense, and you're kind of like, I think that was Jack Webb there. He just had one or two lines. Of course, Suspense was a tricky proposition. In the mid-1940s, It was one of radio's best programs, and nearly every week you had a major star as the lead uh, character. And you didn't really have up-and-coming actors uh, in lead roles in radio's best anthology series. However, there was so much demand for a series like Suspense that CBS did another series called Escape. Much like Suspense, Escape was an exciting anthology series, and the two often uh, did uh, the same stories. An episode of uh, Escape would be done, and later Suspense would uh, 
pick up the same script, particularly as the golden age of radio went on and uh, the need to economize became a big deal. In its early days, Escape gave bigger roles to lesser-known actors. And really, to me, in Escape, Jack Webb got probably some of the best uh, material in his acting career, certainly in his radio acting career. So this is all a long-winded introduction to uh, the next three episodes of The Amazing World of Radio, where we will be bringing you episodes of Escape starring Jack Webb. The original air date on this one is July the 14th of 1947, and the title is Operation Fleur de Lis. <laughs> Escape. Escape tonight to occupied France and the underground. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations presents Escape, a new series of programs of which this, the second, is Operation Fleur de Lis, written and directed by William N. Robeson. <laughs> Today, the 14th of July, the people of a free France celebrate the anniversary of their escape from the tyranny of the kings of Versailles. 158 years ago today, the people of Paris stormed the Bastille and let loose the French Revolution. The torch of liberty set a fire that day never burned more fiercely than during the years when France was occupied by the Nazis. We escape tonight to occupied France, from which three years ago there was no escape. You can call me Duke, but don't use my right name. I might want to go back to France someday. And there are a lot of people in the world that wouldn't understand that what I did was justified in a war. No, I don't have any regrets. Moral ones, that is. It isn't what I did to Rene that keeps me awake at nights. It's just the memory of her. There isn't much about her in my official report on Operation Fleur de Lis. But then it isn't customary to include descriptions of slim, sunburned legs and wide, deep brown eyes in a military document. And anyway, she was only an incident in the operation, even if she became somewhat more important to me. Operation Fleur de Lis began like all the others in the grubby, undistinguished house in London, which was the headquarters of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, otherwise known in various parts of the world as screwballs, cutthroats, spies, cloak and dagger boys, and American underground agents. Gentlemen, Operation Fleur de Lis is planned to assist the advance of our forces once they've secured a beachhead in Normandy. Is that where we're going in, Major? That is one of the possibilities, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. You will jump over Grandmont in northern France, here on the map. You have to set up roadblocks on these three state highways. Here, here... And here. Uh, there is an underground contact near Grandma's? Sir? Yes, Alcine Dutton. He's leader of the local Marquis. He's expecting him. Mm. In addition, you are to block these railroad lines entering and leaving Grandma. These operations are to coincide with the advance of our ground forces. If they land in Normandy. If they land in Normandy. You will in plane tonight at 2100 hours and will drop over your objective at, oh, I should think, approximately 2230. Any questions? Uh, no, I don't think so, sir. Well, yes, sir. I have a question. Yes, Lieutenant? How many of us are going on this mission? Just the two of you. Just the two of us. And all we had to do was organize an underground army, disrupt the supply lines of a half a dozen Nazi divisions, and give support to the entire Allied invasion. Just the two of us. But that's the way the OSS worked. But nobody ordered Hill and me into it. We'd volunteered. I don't know why. Maybe for moments like this one, when you get a B-24 assigned to you as a personal taxi... And there's lots of room to sprawl around after the Bombay. How do you feel? Fine. Scared? Of course I'm scared, aren't you? Me? No. This is a walk. You forget how tough it was when we were at paratroop school at Benning. Yeah, that was real rugged. If the wind wasn't right, you might land in the Chattahoochee and get all wet. And it was always the chance that you'd sprain your ankle coming down too hard. And the sun was so bright on some of those daylight jumps. Whereas we got none of those things to worry about here. A nice pitch black night over France. No sun to blind us. No Chattahoochee River to fall into. Hey, Lieutenant. Yes, Sergeant. Skipper wants to talk to you on the intercom. Thanks. Here, use my cans. Thank you. Duke here. Lieutenant, I'm over your objective. 
Any signal from the ground? Yes, the one arranged. Four dots, two dashes. Green. Very well. You and Lieutenant Hill move into the Bombay catwalk. I'll open Bombay doors in 30 seconds. Roger. Good luck. Thanks. Sergeant, stand by to dump those supplies as soon as we're clear. Yes, sir. Come on, Ed. This, as someone has said, is it. So soon? Just as I was settling down to a good book. Bombay doors are opening, sir. Okay, Sergeant. All right, Ed, let's check your harness. It's a frightful mess. I just can't seem to do a thing with it. I know, but this is the last party you'll have to wear it on. Okay. How am I? Well, don't look now, but your shoot's showing. Tuck it in. Let's get out on that catwalk. <laughs> wow, what a refreshing breeze. And all of France at our feet. You see the signal? That's what I'm looking for. There it is. Over to the left. You got it? Got it. Let's go. You kid. Sure you kid. It helps. But for those ten seconds while you fall free, nothing helps. You hang on to the ripcord and you count off the seconds and you try not to count too fast. Your hand on that ripcord is the only certain thing in the world as you tumble head over teacups with a wind tearing sound from your ears. And there's only one thought, always the same thought, whether it's your first or your fiftieth jump. Will the chute open? It does. Yanking at your armpits, knocking the breath out of you, slowing you down, and you swing there like a rag doll trying to get your bearings. First, you make out the horizon. That's where the black becomes darker black where the stars stop. And you wonder about Ed, but you can't risk calling out. And now that you're located where the stars aren't, you look for the signal light, and there it is, slightly to the left. So you tug at your shroud lines, spilling a little air to guide you toward it. And it's coming toward you awfully fast. And you hope this particular French patriot has picked out a field free of trees and church steeples. And then you try to remember all the things they taught you about hitting the ground and rolling with the wind and collapsing your chute. Because it's always like this. You always feel like you've never hit the silk before. And then you're down, and you roll just right, and you collapse your chute, and it's second nature to you after all. And then you hear footsteps running towards you, and you remember another important instruction. You whip out your automatic, and you hope your French is good enough to get you by. Kiva, who is it? Alcine here. Fleur. Delis. Okay, Alcine, come on. At last you've arrived, Lieutenant. So it seems. You have no idea how long we've wished for this moment. Hold it. That's my partner. Come on. Hey, Ed. Ed. Over here, Duke. You Okay. My ump and I is just slightly damaged, otherwise okay. This is Alcine, our contact. Alcine, Lieutenant Hill. Hello, Alcine. Lieutenant, it is a great pleasure to make your acquaintance. Mm-hmm. And on behalf of my country... Yeah, well, let's get these chutes buried and blow this place. Where's your transportation, Alcine? We haven't any. What? Where's the safe house? You might be able to stay at my aunt's. Oh. I don't think she'd talk. You don't think, aren't you sure? Oh, yes, I'm supremely confident that Where are I... the Germans? They're everywhere. And that is why I'm so glad you're here. Now we can fight again. With your help, we will kill many Bush. Wait a minute. How many are there in your maquis? Myself and two others. Just three of you? Oh, my aching back. But now that the Americans are here, we can do anything. Oh, why don't they get these things straight in London? How can we block roads with a three-man maquis? Three men and an ant who perhaps will not talk. Well, let's get cracking. Duke, you're not going through with this mad venture, are you? What would you suggest? Well, as for me, I'm all for taking the next plane back to London. Another piece of bread, Lieutenant. No, thank you, ma'am. This bone chicken is delicious. How do you call it? K-ration. Supreme. We've had nothing like it since the Bosch came. Yeah, well, you get used to it. And cigarettes, Tom Mary. Cigarettes made of real tobacco. Ah, you Americans have everything. Madame. I'll sing. You are kind, you are hospitable. But the comforts of K-ration will not block roads. We need men. We must form a maquis. But we have a maquis. I Look, my... I'll see. There are three of you and two of us. Sure, we've got guns and we've got ammunition and supply chutes somewhere out in that field where we landed. We've got arms for 50 men. But if we had those men, we still couldn't go to war against a German division. Now, you said yourself there's at least a division garrisoned in Grammont. What must we do? First, we must organize a maquis. We need men. Can you get them? I can go into the village and talk to my friends. You should have done that a long time ago. Falcine, that would be most unwise. Why? Didn't you know? Falcine is a patriot. He's a deserter from the Vichy army, so he's wanted by the Gestapo. Oh, great. And there's a Gestapo headquarters in Grandma, of course. Of course. Falcine is not one to run from danger. Well, quite the contrary. I can get Rene to help. Who's Rene? Alcine's sweetheart, a lovely girl from Paris. Poor thing, she had to come down to the country because her house was bombed out. Let's leave her out of this. But, Lieutenant, she would be most happy to help. Alcine. You've got a lot to learn about guerrilla warfare. You might as well study your first lesson right now. It's short and to the point. No dames. (laughs) 
Well, the next day, we collected the supplies, which had been dropped with us, and we set up a camp deep in the woods. Hill and I were loaded with French money, so we were able to buy food from the friendly farmers. Maybe it was the food as much as patriotism that brought us recruits. Anyway, after a week, we had nearly 30 men. Our maquis wasn't big enough for the job we had to do, but it was growing in the right direction. And then one night as I was winding up a report to London... Huh? What do they say? What do they ever say? Message acknowledged. Carry on. Well, what about new batteries for the radio? What about extra ammunition for the Buck Rogers guns? When are they going to get another drop to us? Why don't you ask them? Yeah, I know. They do the best they can, I guess. After all, we're not the only Boy Scouts in this jamboree. Mm-hmm. Hey, Duke. Yeah? There goes Al Seen again, off toward the road. What the... Hey, Al Seen! Yes? Come here a minute. Yes, Lieutenant. Where are you going? I was just taking a stroll. You on night guard? Not tonight. You weren't on night guard last night, were you? No, Lieutenant. Or the night before? No, sir. But you weren't in camp all night, were you? No, sir. What's the matter? Don't you like the camp? Rather sleep at your aunt's? Is it too rugged out here for you? No, sir. Then where were you? In the village. You know the orders. No one is to go into the village. Yes, Lieutenant, but I only go in at night. That makes no difference. But it does. You see, Lieutenant, I'm so in love. Oh, great. The girl from Paris? Yes. You should see her, Lieutenant. She's the most beautiful, the most charming, the most... Don't you know you're endangering the whole Marquis by disobeying my orders? Oh, no, sir. There's no danger with Rene. She hates the bush. Why, why, she wants to join us. You've told her about us? Oh, yes, sir. Are you out of your mind? How do you know she's all right? I just know that's all. She's the most wonderful person in the world. She, she's a real patriot. I told you, rule number one is no dames. Yes, but Rene is different. Yeah. Well, you better marry her before you bring her around here, or you'll have to share her with the rest of these walls. Lieutenant, do I understand you... Forget to... it, Elsie. It's just an American figure speech. Uh, may I tell Rene she can join us? Well... Not quite yet. Later, maybe. Yes, Lieutenant. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. If you gotta take it, Alcine, take it easy. I do not understand. Just another American idiom, Alcine. Good night. Good night, sir. Hey, Duke. Hmm? You gonna let him get away with that? Well, what are we gonna do? Slap him into the guardhouse for 30 days. Only this isn't the American army. We haven't any guardhouse. Yeah, it stinks from a security standpoint. I know. We try to keep these boys from sneaking off home every now and then. We're not going to have any maquis. Hmm. Ah, he's French. An immoral race. I don't know about that. Remember Phoenix City, Alabama? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> there wasn't anything we could do. If we'd ordered Alcine to stay in camp, he'd have sneaked off anyway. He had that dreamy, faraway look that's baffled parents, teachers, and first lieutenants since the beginning of time. I didn't worry too much about it because our marquee was growing, and Ed Hill and I were breaking our backs pushing those French kids through an airsatz basic in three weeks. Headquarters in London didn't tell us much, but we did know from the BBC that the boys had landed at Omaha Beach, and it wouldn't be long before they'd be needing our roadblocks. And then one morning... About D plus four, I think it was. I was out in the woods running a squad through concealment drill. Oh, no, no. Hit the dirt. Don't wait lieutenant. or you're dead. When you see the signal, hit lieutenant. the dirt right now. Pardon me, Lieutenant. Huh? Oh, I'll see. Where have you been all night as though I didn't know? Lieutenant, I've got to talk to you. Okay, I'll be through here in a half hour or so. I've got to talk to you now. Huh? All right, I'll see. Okay, boys, take five. <laughs> Come along, I'll see. What's on your mind? Lieutenant, my family's been killed. Oh, no. Yes, by the Gestapo. They set fire to the house. My mother, my father, my two sisters. They ran out, the Gestapo shot them. You're sure of this? Yes, I heard it this morning from a neighbor who saw it happen. You poor kid. When can we attack, Lieutenant? When can we stop this endless training and fight the bush? No, I want only to kill and kill and kill until I paid them back for my father, my mother, my two sisters. Yeah, I know. You'll get your chance, Elsine, but not yet. We gotta wait. We're not ready yet. I'm ready. Before I wanted to fight the Bush for my country. Now I want to kill him again and again for them. I know, but you gotta be patient. 
this should happen to me now. Only last night when Anais said she'd marry me, come to live here with me in the camp, I was so happy. And this morning I learned this news. When did you hear from your mother last? Not for a month since we began to work, but I've written her every week. You have? Who mailed the letters? Renee mailed them for me. She's so kind and thoughtful. She, she offered to mail letters home for the other boys, too. Oh, that was nice of her. Did they take advantage of her offer? A couple of them. Who? Paul and Jean. I told them about it. They wrote their families. And Renee mailed the letters, huh? Yeah, she's a wonderful person, Lieutenant. You're going to love her. Yeah, I think I am. She's all I've got in the world now. <laughs> Two and two make four in occupied France, just the same as anywhere else. And sometimes it's just as hard to prove. But one thing was sure. Now I wanted to meet Rene in the worst way. But I had to postpone the pleasure because early that afternoon, one of the outposts broke into camp Lieutenant, out of breath. Lieutenant. Yes, Paul? Uh, the Boche. They're coming down the road through the forest. How many? Uh, I did not stop to count them. Several truckloads, to be sure. Pass the word to Lieutenant Hill. Ask him to bring his detail into camp on the double. Uh, yes, Lieutenant. Alcine. Yes, sir? Take two men and go down by the road and see what they're up to. Yes, sir. Just reconnoiter. Don't fire at them. But this is my chance for revenge. Listen to me. Don't fire at them. That's a command. Yes, sir. They may not be after us at all. Now, get going. Immediately, Lieutenant. What's the order of the day, Duke? Plants, Graham? Yeah, it looks like it. All your men here? The president accounted for. All right, boys. Now gather around, will you, and get yes, this. There's a convoy of Germans coming down the forest road. Good. Oh, That's right. Right. Now, wait a minute. We're not going to fight them. You know what our job is. Roadblocks. We got tanks, artillery, and airplanes that'll be along soon to do the killing. But we have guns. Now look, our security's been pretty good. And those krauts may be on a routine patrol. Chances are they don't even know we're here. They do now. Listen. Yeah. Well, that doesn't. All right, you men got your weapons? Yes, sir. Good. Well, you know the procedure. Get lost. Before you leave the forest, bury your weapons, ammunition, and equipment. Rendezvous at the home of Alcine's aunt at 2200 hours tonight. Good luck. Come on, Ed, let's scram. Well, he who doesn't fight and runs away lives to fight another day. Or something like that. Who tipped them off? I'm not sure, but I got a pretty good idea. Who's down there at the road? Alcine, he's fighting a private war, the poor jerk. The basic rule of three in guerrilla warfare is surprise, kill, vanish. However, when you're surprised, the only rule is vanish. And we did. There were about 50 Germans and a half a dozen dogs to track our scent. They spent the day thrashing through the woods, firing into the underbrush and finding nothing. It was a classic withdrawal. And Hill and I were proud of our little army, with the exception of Alcine, its self-appointed hero. When we arrived at his aunt's house that night for the rendezvous, a half a dozen of the boys were already there. Who is it? Fleur. Julie. Ah, oh, Lieutenant, come in. Good evening, madame. I've seen he's already here. I'm so proud of him. Ah, oh, Lieutenant, I was just telling Tante Marie and the boys it was magnificent. I got two of them. I killed two bush. Your orders were not to shoot. But, Lieutenant, what would you? What happened to the other boys who were with you? Jean was wounded and captured. Antoine became frightened and ran away. That blows the marquee. Now get the full particulars from Jean. They haven't got him already. I'm sorry, Lieutenant, but... Quiet. Answer it, madame. Who is it? No. Julie. Open it. Oh, good evening, madame. Come in, boys. Running any trouble, boys? Uh, as you see, we are here. Yeah. But not for long. Lieutenant, yes, Raoul Paul. and I wish to withdraw from the Marquis. Quit? Why? The risk is too great. Are you afraid? For myself, no. But after what happened to John. He was wounded and captured. We all take that risk. Yes, but last night the Gestapo got John's family. Like they did our scenes. Oh, no. Stood them up in front of their house and shot them. No. Who knows who'll be next? My mother, Raoul's sister, Alcine's aunt. I wish to withdraw. So do I. I'm right, now, wait a minute. I don't blame you for being worried about your families. But whose families do you think the British and American armies up in Normandy are fighting to liberate? Their own? No, yours. Now, this thing isn't as bad as it looks. There's been a leak in our security. Somebody's been putting a finger on us. So we lay low until the leak's plugged. But the Germans are everywhere. Spies, perhaps, too, are everywhere. I think I know who's responsible for these murders. I'll make a deal with you. Give me a couple of days to work it out. We'll issue you boys some money and... All you've got to do is to get lost until Saturday night and then meet me back here. If I haven't patched up our security by then, you can all quit the Marquis and become collaborators. Oh, it is not oh, that, no, Lieutenant. No one wishes to collaborate. But one must think of one's family. Okay. Ed. Yeah, Duke. Give the boys a thousand francs apiece. Right. Come and get it, boy. Come on. Alcine. Yes, my Lieutenant? I'm going to have a little time on my hands for the next couple of days. Do you think you could arrange to introduce me to your girlfriend? 
Oh, but of course, Lieutenant. Maybe if she's okay, like you say, we can let her sign up, huh? I am desolated with happiness, Lieutenant. One thing, none of that Lieutenant business around her until I make sure she's all right. Huh? Very well. You think my French is good enough to pass as a native? But of course, Lieutenant. All right, then. Pass me off as a friend of yours. Let's see. I'll need a name. Let's call me Jacques Dufresne. Jacques Dufresne. Good. I will make the arrangements immediately. I thought you'd like an excuse to get into town tonight. The next afternoon, Alcine brought the girl out to the woods near his aunt's house. I stood behind a tree to watch and make sure they weren't being followed. She was all right. Tall, long, sunburned legs, her hair caught in a blue ribbon like a little girl's. I let them walk by, and then I stepped from behind my tree. Oh, there you are, Jacques. Hello, Alcine. René, this is my good friend Jacques Dufresne. He's from Paris, too. Jacques, this is René de Cibourg. Glad to meet you, mademoiselle. And I'm honored to meet you, monsieur. Where do you live in Paris? Near the Port du Lilas. But my home is no longer there. It was bombed out. Alas, so was mine. My family remain with friends, but I've come out into the country to fight with the resistance. Jacques has much influence with the commander of our Marquis. Oh, I hope you will be able to persuade him to let me join you, monsieur. I shall do what I can. It would be a privilege and an honor to work with a patriot like you. See, Jacques, I told you René was all right. You didn't tell me the half of it. Mademoiselle, you understand that we must be cautious. There are questions I must ask of a confidential nature. Why don't we meet again? Alone. Why not? Say, tonight? I have a little car. But... We, we might take a drive. Fine. But, René, you promised me I that... I can see you some other time, ma chère. Remember, France comes first. <laughs> We just drove that night. She was wearing a white ribbon in her hair and a loose white dress and no stockings. We just drove around in her little Citroën with the top down and the wind blowing her hair like a girl in a magazine ahead. Then we came back about midnight and parked with the bridge. I felt like I was back in high school in Illinois. Look at those stars, Jacques. Yeah. So many of them. So close you can almost reach out and touch them. Yeah. I had them all once, Jacques. I reached out and gathered them all in my arms once. Yeah? I want you to know all about me, Jacques. I want to. Don't think it's wrong of me. But I've been in love. There's nothing wrong in being in love. He was a soldier. Most everybody is these days. A German soldier. Oh. Don't you think that love is bigger than war or hate or anything? Yeah, I guess so. He's dead now. That's good. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, I didn't mean to hurt you. I'm not sorry he's dead. Oh, Chuck, I'm so confused. I want to understand things. I, I want to be intelligent about things. Everything gets so mixed up. Like now. Like now? Yes. Jacques, I've never been so happy as I am tonight. Not even with the German? Not even with him. Why does it have to end? Why do those blessed stars have to go out one by one to make way for another day of war? Why can't we stop time, you and I, and gather all the stars together, just for us? I don't know, baby. It's never been done before. But we can try. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow night? Same time, same place. 
forever if you say the word. Forever? Sure, why not? Who knows how long forever is in this crazy world? Why not have it together? Why not get married? Why not, my most beloved? See you tomorrow night. I'll only be half alive until then. Sherry, if you want to write to your family in Paris, give me the letter tomorrow night, and I'll mail it for you. No, no. Mm. All right, drop that rock and grab a sock. Rise and shine, lover boy. Mm, I brought you a cup of chocolate. Figured you want breakfast in bed this morning. Oh, thanks. How'd you make out last night? Okay. Details. Let's have the details. Nothing much to report. We drove and then we parked for a while and talked. Did she give anything away? No information. She's a funny kid. Her dialogue's as corny as a bobby sox. She knows she's pretty, so she wants to be admired for her mind. But I'm sure she's our Matahari. How come? She offered to mail a letter to my family. Oh, mm, that's consistent. I asked her to marry me. What? She didn't believe me, but she pretended like she did. Oh, I don't know why she's doing what she's doing. Thrills, maybe. French juvenile delinquent, huh? Maybe. Tonight's the night. The night you get married? No, the night we get her. The boys are meeting us here at midnight, you know. What's the plan? Well, I'll take another ride with her. And about midnight, we'll be back and parked by the bridge. Mm-hmm. You'll be there out of sight. Mm-hmm. I'll have some brandy along, and I'll slug her drink with a capture pill. When she's passed out, I'll give you the come on, and you join me. Here, baby, have another drink, huh? <laughs> I shouldn't, Jack. Brandy always makes me sleepy. Well, what of it? This is a celebration of our engagement. Oh, kiss me, Jack. Again and again. Sure. Jack, the stars are nearer. Nearer than they've ever been. Nearer than you think, baby. I love you, Jack. I do love you. Kiss me again. Do it again. And again. Renee. Baby, are you asleep? You collaborationist pig, can you hear me? Okay, Ed. Is she out? Like a red light in an air raid. Here's her purse. Yeah. Start through it while I untangle myself, will you? Now, take a look at this. What is it? A letter from Gestapo headquarters confirming receipt of three addresses. Let me see that. Well, that one's Elsine's family and that one's Jean's. And here's a Gestapo identification card. Flash your light over there. Look at her. What a dish. Look at that kisser. She's responsible for the death of six people whose only crime was being born French. She'd have wrecked our marquee, snafu'd our mission, and turned me over to the Gestapo with her lipstick still on my collar. That gorgeous hunk of double cross. Well, we got the proof. Let's get on with it. Okay. I guess you'd rather I... No, this is my job. Gee, she's gorgeous. Yeah. So long, honey. Thanks. She ain't so gorgeous now. Release that handbrake. Got it. Come on, shove. Not yet. Keep that steering wheel straight. The river's deepest right at the center of the bridge. Yeah. Now, hard right on the wheel. You know something, Ed? Eh? I think she finally did gather that arm full of stars. Sure, the operation was successful. When the time came, our roadblocks tied up three German divisions while Patton rolled on to the east. But I still lie awake at night thinking I should have married that dame. Yeah, the operation was successful, but the patient died. Operation Fleur de Lis was written, directed, and produced by William N. Robeson with Jack Webb as Duke, Elliot Lewis as Hill, Peggy Weber as Renee, and Harry Bartell as Alcine. Operation Fleur de Lis was based on an incident from the files of the OSS, recorded in Sub Rosa by Stuart Alsop and Thomas Braden. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhr. Escape is presented by CBS and its affiliated stations each week at this time. 
Next week, we invite you to escape with F. Scott Fitzgerald in his unforgettable story, The Diamond as Big as the Ritz. And so, good night until next week, when again it will be time to escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Uh, a superb story. I think that this was a very well-adapted tale. And uh, you not only get Jack Webb in this, you also get Elliot Lewis. Uh, Elliot Lewis was another up-and-coming actor who on Mutual was starring in Voyage of the Scarlet Queen and would later go on to really work behind the microphone on so many series. And like Webb, that was really where his true ambitions lie. But they really did play off each other really well. Webb did bring some of his hard-boiled characterization to his portrayal of Duke, but I think it didn't go over the top at all. I think it was just uh, the right tone and tempo for this character. It's a very realistic story. And it was actually only the second broadcast episode of Escape. The one thing I did question in this was the combination of shooting and then uh, sending the car over. It did seem like it'd make more sense for it to be one or the other. But as this was adapted from the OSS files, it's safe to assume that that's just probably how it happened in real life. So it doesn't really need dramatically explained. I should note that I have played this episode before on The War, about five years ago. But I think this one definitely is worth uh, hearing again. So I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll join us back here on Monday when we will have another Jack Webb-led episode of Escape. Uh, in the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.